Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Peter and welcome to another tutorial. Uh, this time we're going to talk about um, two C-sharp classes, well, one and a half, um, that I actually didn't know existed and that actually helped me quite a lot with uh, debugging. So these two classes of course are debug and partially trace. Um, and these are native C sharp classes. They're actually in the system diagnostics or diagnostic um, namespace. And they have a whole lot of interesting features uh, and interesting methods that we might use. Now I'm going to demonstrate those on uh, this example project that I prepare. Now I've got a, uh, a bunch of uh, Git branches so that I don't have to type for you. Hopefully it's going to save some time. Um, but ye, let's start with a super quick seven second overview of the whole project. It's super trivial. Um, we have a console application um, written in .NET 5 and we have a class library um, written in .NET standard. Uh, both of them are in the same solution and the console app has a reference to uh, the core uh, library. And this, this will uh, become important uh, a little bit later. So let's first explain uh, the, the biggest elephant in the room here, and that's uh, inside the core library, there is a new class that I created called local data processor. It has a process directory method. You give it a path, and it basically lists all the files in that path. That's it. Nice and easy. Now the console app, uh, uses this uh, this local data processor and uh, passes the my videos folder to the process directory method. Now what might be strange for you is Peter this doesn't look like my standard main. Um, this is because as I said this one is uh, this console app is written in .NET 5 uh, it is using, I'm pretty sure this is a C-sharp 9 feature, it's implicit main, where you don't actually have to create the, the, the program class and the main method. You can just start writing the code in your classic like program CS, or it doesn't really have to be named program CS, I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, but there just there can only be one implicitly typed um, implicitly typed uh, main file, right? Um, now, what c -sharp basically does in the background is it just generates the class and the main file for you. It's not like you can just write code anywhere. It, they're still there. It's just that, you know, it's, it's a syntax, uh, syntax sugar. You just don't have to see it. Now, that, however, isn't the topic of this video. Uh, the topic of this video is we have a lot of uh, write lines around here. Actually, if I, if I run it, if I run, run the application, you're going to see that, hey, we have like the name of the program here. Um, we have the path that we got from environment. By the way, environment, a special uh, folder contains a, uh, it's an enum of uh, interesting, interesting different uh, special folders you might want to find, like uh, program files, all sorts of stuff. Uh, the thing is, a lot of them do not exist on Linux, uh, or they don't have alternatives, so uh, they're going to resolve to empty empty paths in the end. Um, but that's just you know that's just that's not even topic of the, the topic of this video. Uh, and then of course we see uh, the three files that I uh, created in my uh, videos folder. Now that's all fine and dandy. Um, so let's uh, spice things up. The first thing that may that may happen, let's go to branch two, is that we might instead of videos we might require a history. Now history apparently the directory that serves as a common repository for internet history items. Maybe we want to see what I've been up to with my internet history and stuff. So I'm going to hit on that run here. However, we're going to get an exception. Now the exception we can read into it and figure out that oh the path is empty. Now the path is empty. Um, if we dug a little further into the stack trace, we would realize that it is in fact get files that's throwing it uh, when it tries to get all the files of an empty path. Now that's fine. However, 
it's just an example project uh, it's just an example uh you know scene that i created it there's no point in trying to debug this there's nothing to debug uh this is of course intentional so what you might what you might normally do is of course fix the underlying issue which which in this case was require requesting history instead of whatever instead of uh, videos or whatever um however you might want to also try to patch this you might add a little guard statement normally you would do something like you know if um uh, if the path is null or white space right you would do something like maybe you would throw a lot of a lot of the times you would just throw here um but then the uh, or maybe you just like print nothing you just return that's also a valid this is uh, a common sort of like clean code ish pattern called return early um where you try to try to return um as early as possible instead of nesting things like you know you know with oh come on with uh not and then putting everything in here um either way that's not what we're gonna do we're gonna do something uh completely different we're gonna actually use the um debug class for this so let me switch to another branch here we're using the first method of debug and that's assert so of course debug comes from system diagnostics now i know it's plural um and this assert method takes in first a boolean boolean which is a condition uh, and then a message now um, it has three more overloads that's because it has a, a message and a detailed message and the message detailed message which is formatted and then the format options um, kind of like console write line really now the thing is um, that when you you probably know assert from uh, let's say unit tests right where a failure a failed assert is uh, going to be a failed test now in our application it kind of does something similar uh, what, what assert actually does is if this condition isn't true which in this case we are asserting that the path isn't null or white space um, if the if that assertion fails the whole application stops um, this message is printed along with the with the um, stack trace now the interesting thing about this is that this isn't necessarily always into the console if you have a GUI application um, and not a console app um, this message will pop up as a as a message box as an error box and that might be better for you because sometimes you're working with GUI applications such as Avalonia maybe or WinForms, WPF, Pick Your Poison. Um, you're you're not going to have a nice way of logging things. Uh, you don't you don't have that console unless you spin a console like alongside your application, which might be useful. But um, again, that might uh, be too much effort when it's not set up prior to you debugging. It might be useful to just set up a lot of sanity checks, a lot of these assertions. It's like proving what you think is going on like you're like well i'm pretty sure this path isn't like null here right prove it assert it right you add all these asserts into your application on various places and then you run the application wherever it stops which we'll actually see um sorry if i dot net run it you're going to see that this time we're not getting an exception although we're getting something similar it says process terminated uh, assertion failed gives us the 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 description of our um of our assert as well as a stack trace now these stack traces are usually super small because they don't that because they they actually refer to the line of the assert right now in this case it goes from program main by the way uh, you can see how, how they're like named here i was like program in like pointy brackets and a dollar uh, that's only because uh, this program class was auto generated by by dot net and the, and the, so was the the main method right so that's interesting right uh, but that's beside the point we know where it failed it's exactly this file line 11 which is here this assert failed now the interesting thing 
about debug methods is that they won't run in release mode. So if I do .NET run, however, I provide the configuration or you can shorten it to uh, C uh, release. If I if I uh, run it uh, in release configuration in a re release configuration, you're gonna see that we get the classic uh, we we get the classic you know argument exception, the one thrown from here. So it ignores all of these debug methods when the configuration isn't debug. Now I did not test if um, these um, if, if these calls are stripped, they might possibly be completely stripped. So you possibly don't get any impact of these um, these lines being in your code. Uh, that of course I'm not sure about. It might be that they're actually there and being executed except the first thing that happens in them is check for the configuration they just return. Um, either way, it's a, it's a, that's a very nice default behavior so that you don't maybe like, uh, if you're, you, you can actually like deb debug assert, like add some like secrets here or whatever. Like you, you just want to know the state of the, uh, you know, of the application. You might want to see like the username. What, what was it? Like what happened? Right. Um, so that's really useful. However, there is more, <laughs> um, let's step to stage four where uh, we're going to be using uh, a new cool thing. Instead of console write lines, we're now using debug.write lines in our console program. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we, we do that here as well. Debug write line instead of uh, console write line. Now, the interesting thing is that's better for the class library because the class library can be used by both console application, but also maybe a GUI. Maybe a GUI is using this this library, and at that point, uh, writing it to the console doesn't make much sense because it's going to be stand standard output, which for the GUI might be genuinely nothing. Um, so you just won't see output from it, right? Now, however, if you use debug write line, that's a different story. So I change all of the console write lines to debug write lines, right? And we'll see what happens, right? What would you expect? Oh, by the way, I changed it back to my video so that we don't get that exception. Uh, you would expect that we get a bunch of uh, debug write line statements um, and all the three files that we had before, right? So if I don't have run it now, nothing, nothing gets printed. And that's interesting because the, the, the reason for that is that there is nothing that actually listens to all these uh, debug write line uh, statements. Um, we need to add a uh, add listeners. Now here's where um, I ran into a tiny tiny bit of prob trouble. There is uh, debug dot listeners. That's what uh, MSDN kind of wants you uh, to to use. It wants you to do to create a uh, a, a, a writer trace listener. And then added like debug listeners add. That's what they want you to do. However, here's a problem. Uh, the first problem, if you try it, it just won't work. And the reason is that debug.listeners property is not in .NET Core nor .NET 5. However, um, I was able to figure figure it out by carefully reading the docs. <laughs> like I probably was the first person that ever actually read the docs and and found out a solution to a very niche problem. I read here that like the, the, the listeners collection is shared by both debug and the trace classes. And so if you want to register a listener for, for debug, you don't use debug listeners, you use trace.listeners. Now trace is a class that is also in system diagnostics. Let's actually switch to it. It's stage five where I registered two two listeners by trace dot listeners dot add. And then the first one is uh, both of them. They're, they're instances of uh, what's, what, what did they call it? Trace listener or they inherit from trace listener. You could write your own if as long as you inherit from trace listeners, at least trace listener, you're going to be able to use it. Um, the, the default one kind of takes a stream. 
So I created a new instance, well, not only a stream. Uh, I created a new instance of text writer a trace listener, and to, into one of them, I, I put uh, console out. That means that's going to use console. And then another one to which I use the constructor that takes a file name here. And uh, this file name, um, it, it's just the file that it's going to create and write stuff into. Um, it's going to use both. However, if you just did that, uh, it still wouldn't print anything. And the reason is that uh, you need to set up auto flush. If you, I mean, unless you, you want uh, other, you, you want to do another approach. Now, what's flushing, right? You probably understand the concept of flushing from like uh, your daily life. But in this context, it means you're ac accumulating messages and um, at one point, at the flush point, you take all these messages and actually display them through or send them to all these listeners, right? Um, if you don't have auto flush to true, you could do it manually. You could go for trace.flush, which will flush all these messages, but it's going to seem weird because first of all, you would do it after every time you write something. Um, and second of all, you might want to try debug.flush which exists but won't work because all of, all of our listeners are in trace right so i find it generally better for myself at least to set up trace auto flush true so that every time you write something it's going to automatically flush to all listeners um because now if i just run it we've got the same behavior uh, as we did before uh, this time I also spiced it up a little uh, with the date and time because now uh, I can see it in my uh, console here, but I can also see that it created a new file uh, wherever I ran it from, which in this case is the project uh, folder here, debug.log, and if I open it, it contains the same thing. Now an important thing to note is that if I change this to history again and I invoke a uh, debug assert failure um i still see the asser assertion failing here however the assertion failing is not going to show up in the um it's not going to show up in uh the log now the reason for that is that this is not a message it's uh it actually terminates an assertion failure terminates the entire program tr and tries to display to you um what went wrong uh, with both the, the the message and the stack trace. Now, much like a debug assert, this thing, oops, you can see that we have these uh, kind of like two logs here. I'm gonna, let's say, delete it just for um, ease of, uh, just to see it a little better. If I, again, .NET run it with in release mode, all of these debug statements are going to be ignored. So we do not get any message in our console and we do not get anything in our debug log. And of course, again, I can show you that if I run it without release, um, that is not the case. It starts uh, printing. So that's interesting, that, that's great. That's something that we might want to keep. Debug right line, start, start, you know, maybe starting to use debug right line here and there just to like print information, print random stuff. But if you do that a lot and like preemptively before there is an error, uh, you're gonna get like all sorts of stuff. You're gonna get like a, uh, like a lot of different things and you might not orient yourself uh, around all those debug uh, right lines. Well, we have two more interesting features. Uh, there's a lot more, honestly, and you should probably go read the debug class documentation. Um, however, um, let's take a look at another feature to make this a little, a little more, more readable, and that's stage six, which is um, right line if. Very interesting, very interesting simplification here. Um, right line if is exactly what it says. It takes in a boolean as a condition, much like assert, and it takes a message. 
to display. But it's only going to print uh, or write line this message if this condition is true. So in this case, I used it to basically print all of the uh, or write line all of the files if their extension is txt. You can see that if I run it now, I get um, the two files here. Yep, the two files. That's interesting. Um, again, why wouldn't you use like if an if statement around it? And again, I am fairly sure that it is because the whole debug right line if statement will not be in the final, uh, like in the published uh, compiled version of your application if you're compiling it with the uh, release uh, mode in the release configuration um, and that's interesting that's that's that'd be very very useful now but let's make it a tiny tiny bit more readable this wasn't a readability improvement that was just like a cool feature so let's go to stage seven where we're going to find debug indent where it does an indent and unindent, of course, which does exactly what you uh, might think it does. It actually just indents. It indents um, any message that is after this indentation. Of course, you can indent it multiple times. You could. Um, I don't know why you might want to do it, but you could like do it. If I do it like in the loop, then everyone will be like slightly more indented it's you know what i mean actually it won't mm, that's strange maybe there's just one indentation level allowed or maybe the the console doesn't display did it actually output here no strange either way indentation might help you here um you can actually pick the indentation size uh, because it, it defaults here to four spaces, but you can actually pick it in, again, as a trace config, uh, trace dot indent size, which is going to be, let's say, if we do seven, then we should indent by seven spaces, I'm pretty sure. There we go, that's seven spaces. And uh, here's here might be uh, the problem here, which is indent level. Which is interesting. Is that an int? Let's see what this is. Oh, it doesn't exist in the current. Yeah, well. Oh, is, is it a method? I don't know. Either way, read about that if you're interested. I don't care much for indentation, but alas. Um, so that's, that's very cool. Very cool. Uh, let's also take back the changes to this file. Um, so again, indentation, indent, unindent might be something you want to use. Let's actually take a look at another thing here, which is a Boolean switch. Now, Boolean switch is is a an interesting thing. Um, when I was talking about you planting a lot of these um, write lines and, and debug statements all over your application and them getting unwieldy or you not being able to see what's uh, going on, you might use a Boolean switch. Now. A boolean switch is exactly just like it's it's an alternative to just having like a boolean like a flag of flags in an application right but instead of for features therefore specifically for these uh well you might use them for whatever but in this case for the debugging context uh for writing um you know switching on and off different different uh debug uh messages now you can give them you can give them names, you can give them description, and you can give them a default value. Now the default value needs to be a stringified version of a truthy or falsy uh, value. So it can be true, false, capital T true, capital F false, one and zero. There's probably a couple that it's gonna parse, but alas, I would just stick to true or false, or if you don't wanna risk a misspell, just one or two. In this case, we have uh, this switch enabled. So I'm a, this, I am I call this switch uh, print all, print all switch. And I here I debug, debug right line uh, if it's enabled, 
Uh, it is enabled at this point because I set the default value to one, which is true. Um, and here, when I decide uh, to to either write only txt files, um, I'm actually I actually edited this condition a little bit to say um, write um, write a file if either the print all switch is enabled or if it's uh, if it's a txt file. So if I have print all enabled in this case, uh, it's going to print all of the files like this. And if I turn it to like zero here, turn it to false, then it's only going to print txt files. Now that's interesting. Uh, of course, I could check this is a class. This is just a normal Boolean and I can uh, I can basically use it in a normal if statement, right? To say, hey, if this is enabled, do something extra or don't do something extra, it doesn't matter, right? But you, you might want to combine it with the debug switch by saying, uh, sorry, with the debug right line if, basically to say, hey, uh, right line if this uh, switch is enabled, right, whatever, like uh, the value of, uh, I don't know, foo is seven, right? Now, if you had multiple of these statements around, like plenty of them, or maybe you wrap it in a uh, simpler method, um, you can turn these messages on or, on or off by, uh, by just switching this switch. Uh, now, this is a bit questionable because you would be like, well, why would I do that? Because this is this is a lot of syntax and uh, it's essentially just a Boolean. Well, uh, one of the features that um, was making this a lot more useful was the config. Um, a lot of framework applications use app config. They have a configuration. You can still get app config if you have uh, the um configuration manager nougat package and basically you would be able to define these in your config file uh, i don't know if i still have it open it was here yeah just just like uh, you can you can set up the auto flush and indent size uh, you could also configure so just like there's trace you could configure like switches i'm pretty sure it was like switches and then you could configure all these switches in there uh, which would be nice because you could just change it in the configuration manager and you wouldn't have to recompile. Now you also wouldn't have to recompile if you just took the default value of every switch you have from like a config file of your own, right? So it doesn't necessarily matter, you can just do it. You can also like emulate the same behavior. So the default value would take that from like a config or JSON file or app config. I think we have app config JSON these days in like .NET 5 very commonly. Uh, although I still think you need like a configuration reader or something. That's useful. No, that's useful. <laughs> All right. Let's take a... Is that it? I have one more apparently. I don't even know what I'm... Uh, stash and check out. Yep. Delete me. And that's... Uh, Ah, yes, and that's the final thing, and that's just straight up debug fail. If you want to make sure that it's like the maybe, like in this case, it was, it's just a bogus thing here where it says, oh, well, if it contains Bob, then whatever. This is a great replacement for what I'm doing so often in like these simple applications that I just write. I want to like test this and I just like don't let's say um now I'm going to keep it with this example like I want to make sure that this works I just want to check out the path but I don't actually want it to process the directory because maybe that would just delete files and whatever so I can go here and type in debug.fail I don't even have to like really give it a reason but I'm going to do like whatever um and then and then that's it it's never going to continue f farther you know or maybe like you know whatever like execution ended right it's net it's not going to uh, get past that now it's an it's a, a replacement for just a return statement here uh which is going to give you warnings about unreachable code 
um, whereas, of course, debug, debug fail won't. Uh, yeah, I, I should not have deleted it. Let's see if I can get it back. There you go. Uh, if I run it now, of course, this is just going to fail. It just says assertion fail. It's the same as failing an assertion, but you don't have to like create that like uh, debug assert false, right? You can just type in debug fail. This would this is fairly useful um, if you want to like maybe if you know that the bug is definitely not past that point, and you're trying to like you're like debug right lining uh, through through this part, but you don't want it to go over that. It's just gonna terminate the process when it gets there. Very nice. Um, that's it. So that's, uh, that is about debug, the, the class, and a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit about trace. Now I would encourage you to explore on your own. Um, of course, the best resource for um, information about this is uh, MSDN, especially the debug class. Uh, where you see a lot of remarks that I definitely um, missed and plenty of uh, interesting tips and tricks, uh, plus all of the methods, all of them that we didn't actually talk about, like write, uh, we, we use write line, there's also a normal write uh, option, there's just print, uh, flushing, failing, etc. Um, I would advise you to take a look at that as well. All right, and of course, uh, check out the trace class because we didn't talk about uh, this one. Might have it actually has some some really cool features with uh, tracing levels and stuff. Um, but about that, we can maybe talk about that some some other time. All right, well, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you I hope your days of console right lining for debug, just for normal applications you might still want to use it, but for debug purposes. I hope the days of console right lining is, uh, are over and we can all enjoy uh, happier debugging. All right, I'll see you guys in the next video. See ya.